Um, Joe Geiersek is the resident artist at and brand manager for Blick Market or Art Materials. He's an instructor, a juror, an author, and travels extensively conducting lectures, painting demos, and workshops. He holds many esteemed memberships, including to Gold Brush, Saga Mundi Club, Oil Painters of America, and many more. He has studied at the School of Visual Arts and Parsons School of Design, among others. His work has been exhibited in galleries across the country. In his work, he aims to capture the fleeting moments of life and infuse a sense of light, atmosphere, and mood. Uh, today, he's going to be walking through how to complete a painting. So, please help me in welcoming Joe. Okay, everyone, any, everyone here? Okay, good? Yeah. yeah. All right, so, uh, wait, what are we doing? Complete it then or critique it on? Complete it. Are we looking at people's paintings? Uh, yes, they have them. Yes, they brought okay. the paintings. Everybody that brought a painting? Uh, they're over here. Would you mind bringing them up? All of you who brought a painting today? I'm the man. And, yeah, we put them on the mantle. That's a good idea. Oh, that's where yours? Over here. Okay, good. I'll put them up. They're cooking. Do you want to one at a time? Yeah. Okay, just one at a time. Okay, so uh, I'm always writing notes for these events. Last year, I think I sent that to you, Mary, but I don't know if you put it on the screen. Which, I'm sorry, which one? That double page spread, remember? The artist mind thing. Uh, no. That's all right. I'll send it to you again. Okay. But anyway, um, last year on the way to the plein air convention, I opened up a, uh, I, I had no paper and I had no pen. So I, I was inspired to write my lesson for the plein air convention. On the, on the way there, I had, I had time to think about it, but I was on the plane and I I, I asked the person next to me, do you have a pen? And, and then, I, then I'm looking through a magazine and I see a double page spread in the, uh, in the magazine and it, and it was open, like you could write a lot in it. So I wrote uh, the whole lesson plan across the thing. And uh, so when I went to a convention and I saw Eric, and I said, uh, Eric, this is unbelievable. Uh, I'm going to put this thing, I want this thing on the screen. Yeah, but they, they have to type it out and look at it. It's all handwritten like that. I said, no, that's, that's the beauty of it. It's like <laughs> I thought about it and I wrote it down. And that's the way I went, oh, okay, that's cool. So then I saw Kevin McPherson came by and I said, Kevin, I wrote this thing, look at I want you to look at it. He looks at it, he goes, well, how much are you going to sell that for? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he goes, you know, you could sell that. Or maybe I should have. Uh, anyway, it talked about the artist mindset. It talked about approaching a painting and all this stuff. And so in my career, where I am now, um, I've established a lot of things work very hard over I've been painting for 40 years and so a lot of different things have happened in the last many years nationally for me and um, I'm 56 and I'm moving I'm still doing plein air events but I'm moving more towards uh, you know the future when my wife and I retire what am I going to do you know like am I going to do workshops, develop more workshops, and I'm doing that kind of stuff. And I uh, started getting to be asked to do a lot of judging of these plein air shows. So last year, um, I was in the Adirondack, uh, and I did the, the Adirondack uh, plein air festival, and I'm judging it, and um, so they said, well, 
uh, Joe, you have like 400 paintings to judge. And, you, and we're going to give you like an hour and a half or two hours. I said, well, you know, I need an assistant for that. You know, like I can't. <laughs> so I, I, they gave me two assistants. And so I'm going to give you uh, a little insight to how a judge has to handle these things. So. Uh, and the same thing actually occurred last year because it won the grand prize. It's like an honor. They have a local color thing in Easton, and they have 400 paintings as well from uh, their group local kind of color. And so I experienced the same thing twice in the summer, 400 paintings and 400 paintings. And um, I was worried about doing a good job because... Uh, not that I never judged before. I did, did judge for American artists a, a few times. We had very big national contests with Stephen Doherty and everything. I've been a judge many times. But to have a time frame like that and how do you do it? So um, my method was unconventional. And I told them, I'm, I'm going to go through the galleries three times, two, three times. And then I'm going to start talking to you about which ones I want you to take off the wall. And so, uh, so I went through, and then I went, as I went back, I started to see ones that were really speaking to me. Oh, pull this one, pull this one, put them down. And I wanted them lined up on the floor in big groups so that uh, I could see over you, like, okay, if you have 400 paintings, say, like, I picked 30, 40 paintings. Now they're on the floor, so now I could see them. So then, um, after I pulled through that, and I realized, you know, some people are more talented in the way of finishing paintings than others, and you might have like two or three from one artist. So it's like, oh, okay, well, this guy or this lady, they can't get all the, I, I can't do it. I can't give all those people the same award to the same person. Even if they rightfully deserved it, I try to be very mixed. I try to pick pa uh, past, uh, the best pastel, the best, best watercolor, the best oil painting, and, and then figure out from there, I have 11 awards or whatever, where is that going to fit in all this business? So uh, when I walk through, um, you guys are trying to figure out like how to finish a painting. And if you're entering these events, you ha have to go through a checklist of things uh, to make sure that everything's in place. So uh, I just jotted some notes down here um, on, the, on the airplane again. Uh, you know, so there's a thing called the it factor or the X factor. And that's something that nobody can teach you. There's something in the painting, and that's usually at the end anyway, but I said it first because I wrote it on the top. But there's something in the painting that has a universal appeal. And we all know what that is because we go into the museum over here and we see the painting. And millions of people are coming to see that same painting and take pictures of it. Or, and, and, and we can't. We don't even know sometimes exactly, but it speaks to so many people. So there's something there which has some originality, some spirit of the artist in it. Um, a lot of times when I'm doing these demos and stuff, uh, I don't know if you guys watch the Long Island Medium, but I, I channel artists. Like, they speak in my head. So I'm like, all right, be quiet. Like, you know, I have to do something here. But things come to me about from all these different parts of history. And I don't know how that happens. Maybe I need counseling. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so from there, you're going to look at your, uh, your, your, the first thing is, and we have to do this in re reverse. So the first thing, your first good thing or bad thing is your theme. So when you started your painting, when you started this painting, did you, where you said you, what you liked or whatever you saw, did it finish that way or did it mutate to something else? You have to ask yourself that. Did I hold true from the beginning of my painting to the end of the painting or I said along the way, now I'm going to reinvent this some other way? Well, that, 
if you reinvent it along the way, it might be bad news. You know, if you didn't stay to the theme of what you originally saw or wanted to say, because that part is very true. It will come through in the painting. And also, I'd like to add a little bit of thing to that. Were you excited about what you were painting? Don't just paint to paint. There's no use in that at all. What kind of subjects excite you is going to help you, even in these competitions, to, to stand out a little bit. Because if you, if you have a fascination with figures, like people were talking about, and paying attention to what people were saying before, um, in a scene, and you paint them really well, and that works for you, then don't go off and start painting something else that you don't know. Paint what you're good at. Start from your strength. That's the way I teach in my class, my workshop. Always start from the strength of the artist. I don't like to be negative. What does the artist have that is their strength? Because everybody in here has a unique, some sort of strength in their painting or whatever they're creating. They have a unique spot that nobody else, by the way, might have in the room. Then you're going to look at your design, your motif, like we talked about before, right? How the paint's traveling through it. I'm not going to go over all that again, but I'm just kind of pinpoint, uh, going down the checklist. Then your value, we already talked about that. You guys had a lesson this morning, we talked about that. If you fracture that value system, you fracture your painting, it's also going to hurt the painting. Like it's going to be, something is going to be disturbing in the painting, and somebody will see that. Now, this is the time where I pulled this out, and they say, oh, this is the truth factor. You know, like when you go around and you look at different paintings, and you see how well they're put together, uh, this doesn't, doesn't lie. So if something is really whacked out in the painting, you're going to, as a judge, I use this tool. I use these different tools. I use this. I use, uh, well, not necessarily the cropper. I mean, this is my most important tool. And then when I'm walking around, I kind of eliminate a lot of things like this because I can see problems with the design or the value structure right from here. And then I kind of... What is that called? It, this is just like... Um, it's, it's a... Kind of a plexiglass right. or something, but you can get it at Blick. It's a viewer, it's just a viewer, red value viewer or something. Are you talking about that, that image that you had with the proportion of the values? Yeah. When you say fractured values, yeah. it would be not, it wouldn't be that. Well, your structure of your painting. So okay. if you, you know, I can't go over it because we don't have enough time for that, but if you had a scene, and the scene has in, inappropriate values in areas where they shouldn't be, or you somehow lost track of how to hold it together, it's a problem. It'll come up as a problem for a judge. And then, uh, you know, the drawing is important. But notice, and I put them in priority, value structure, then drawing. You would think, oh, you know, it's the art school, the drawing has to be great. Yeah, no. Drawing is something we're all working on constantly, including me. So you, and then the drawing is one thing with a pencil or whatever, or a stick, but then learning to draw with a brush is a whole other thing because when you're a plain air painter, if we're focused on that topic, you have to really learn how to draw with the brush. That's something that you have to learn. So um, that's number four, though, on the list of priorities. Color is number five. And uh, I love this quote because I often use it. Uh, Degas said, if it were not for the galleries, I would just do black and white painting. So, uh, <laughs> that color is a luxury. So it's a luxury. So you, you, you know, that's not as important as the other things, right? And then where uh, the more uh, advanced or intermediate artists separate from the beginning is the treatment of the edges in the painting. Remember we talked about that before, I'm just reminding you again, too many sharp edges or it could be really annoying in a painting. I mean, it's not Joe G saying it's what makes great painting. So if you have too many important edges everywhere, it's not good. You know that you're not thinking 
where to lose or destroy stuff, destroy some edges. I hadn't taken a workshop from anybody in years, and then I uh, took a workshop by John Redman uh, from Philadelphia. He's a great painter. And I just was curious because I always love his paintings, so I wanted to sit in his class. And I knew, you know, it was kind of like I didn't want to let him know where I was in my career. I just wanted to sit and listen. And the thing that I loved about John's class was learning how to build up and destroy, like Whistler talked about. Build up, destroy, build it up again, and kindly, finally fix areas that are important and leave the rest of them alone where they can go off. Now that's an aesthetic thing, but it certainly helps your painting. And then uh, number seven, like we talked about before, which can really help your painting, is surface manipulation. Now, you see in more advanced painters, when you walk in a gallery or something, you see paintings that you're attracted to. Then you go a little bit closer and you say, oh, I, I like that. Then the paintings that all of you, just like me, really like, you say, wait a minute, I want to find out how that thing was put together. So then all of a sudden you're like here and the guard's saying, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, you, but you, at first you don't see this. You see from a distance. So, uh, uh, oh, oh. Forget his name now. It'll come to me later. But I saw an artist painting, and I can't think of his name now. It's at the tip of my tongue. But it, it, the painting attracted me from far away, like 50 feet away. And I went up to the painting, and I was surprised that it was that artist. I can't think of their name now. But um, the point was, something is pulling you to the painting, right? So uh, once we're past all that, how to view your paintings with fresh eyes? So. You, May I ask a question? Yes. What please. exactly do you mean by surface manipulation? Oh, so like, uh, you know, uh, everything can't be treated the same. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have two things that are really important, variety and unity. You have to have a certain amount of unity in the painting, but you also need within those unity areas variety. Does that make sense? You can't have just uh, areas of uh, mundaneness everywhere. You can have a little mundane, but you can't have the same treatment everywhere. You need some action versus some quietness, some complexity versus some simplicity. You have to think like that, always in contrast of everything you're doing, just like we were talking about before in the painting uh, demo. And then, um, so when you're there and you're standing by yourself and you're saying, well, I have to get away from my painting um, so that I can understand what I did. You, the first thing you have to do is get away from the easel. Uh, my first article I wrote uh, for American Artists Magazine was painting uh, uh, interiors. Uh, uh, and, and the thing I talked about in there was my students, I had to arrest their painting development. So you have to pull the, <clears throat> sometimes the student even away, because a lot of times the painting is at a good stage and we just continue on to, to destroy our work. So um, you have to get a distance away from your painting. And like we talked about before, the reduction lens, if you can just um, have, get one of these and then so look look through that, and the further you can get away from your painting, you can see it. Now, this is maybe breaking the rule for plain air, I don't know, but they say no photographs or anything. But at the end, everybody takes photographs of their finished paintings before they enter them, or they have to sign them, or whatever. I have found this to be very valuable, is taking my final photographs of my paintings, and not using a photograph, but taking a photograph of it and seeing, oh my God, how did I miss that? Because once it's reduced, I see, shoot, I really screwed up there. Like this area needs to be fixed. Like, so if you're not in the company, start using that now. If everybody has the darn cell phone, use it and look at your painting reduced and look, scan it. 
all the way around, and you'll see, oh yeah, that area, I don't like it. It's too loud, or it's, it's too confusing, or it's too abstract, or it's a, an annoyance in this area or something. It'll come to your eye. The thing that I have learned as a more mature artist is the conversation that starts to happen as a, an advanced painter with you and your painting. A lot of painting for the master painters doesn't happen at the easel, believe it or not. It happens from a distance. And they, they're letting the painting speak to them. And you have to learn the language of the painting speaking to you. The painting will actually tell you what needs to be done if you start to train your mind to do that. Because if you give yourself a chance, it's called taking a break and looking at something fresh. You know. So you have to do that. Um, the other thing that you can use is a black mirror. And if you don't have a black mirror, just use your phone because that is a black mirror. You can actually um, put it like this, right on the bridge of your nose, and you can look at your painting in the reverse and see the values and see the problem or whatever. So if you're looking with one eye into this, you're getting the reverse of your painting and you can see all the catastrophes. Right? Or if you don't have that, uh, taking the painting and flipping it upside down um, will automatically... Uh, somebody said Scott, I thought Scott Tillman Powers, when I was in my first competition with him, I was watching him at the end finish, he's a terrific painter, when I was watching him finish his painting, and we're all learning from everybody, each other, right? I watched him at the last couple minutes of finishing his painting for the competition, he flipped the painting over, and he was looking for all those naughty things, like bad edges and everything, but you really can see it fresh. When I'm in my studio and my students are there, and I want to punish them and make them flip the painting. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, the, your goal in the painting should not be to make it more complex, but as you go along in the painting, if you're going to really develop as a painter, how can you simplify it, say it with less, to make it more? So you should always be aiming to simplify. So if you see areas... Joe Paquette and I uh, were trained under the same teacher, John Foote. He was a great British painter, portrait painter from England. He was fabulous in School of Visual Arts. And he, he would make us paint for six hours a day with a figure. And we were exhausted. And my painting was all screwed up. And then he would come along, sit in my chair, and fix the painting or in ten minutes, like, simplify it. I was like, so, I was like, no. Nah. It can't be that simple. <laughs> but anyway, that's all that idea. So now we're going to look at these paintings. this painting to make it a little bit higher than where it is. It's not a bad painting. It needs just to go a little bit further. It usually does. So you see the areas... Oh, you know what? I you know, I had a pointer. I have a laser pointer. Yeah, I have. Oh, yeah. So uh, this uh, area is... I mean, yeah. this... Well, this area is really beautiful in this painting. Very nicely done, really, really well. This area down here is also nice, but and even that. But there's just a couple things I would adjust in this painting. So uh, 
This this uh, piece, this slab here, is a little heavy. I, I don't know, I would vary it a little bit more, okay? And uh, as we go back from here, this needs variety. This is a dark spot that's a little heavy compared to this. I would make this fall off a little bit lighter because it's a little bit further back than that. And I don't need the same amount of light that I have here on this back here. See? So I'm going to merge this, and I'm actually going to um, soften that more, and that's going to help with the, all this beautiful work that was done in the trees. This is all good. This is all good. And I would just soften this down here, and this is a little hard edge here I don't need either. So those are initial things that I would just point out to that artist and have a knock, just knock it down a little bit here and there, and it would make a big difference in the painting initially. It's easy for me. It doesn't make me anything special, but the only thing that's special about me looking at this is that I've never looked at it before, and it's easy for me to see after painting for a long time, I have a fresh eye and tell you what to do. It doesn't mean I'm anything special, but the, this is definitely, like we said, the paintings speak to you. This is speaking to me. This area and this, I don't want that like that. I want to vary this to make it a less of a, a, a deep value there, and I want to remove that because those two things, if you put your finger over them, um, they don't help the painting. So, uh, little things like this, but you learn that along the way. Like this will, the paintings do talk to us. Okay? Okay, so this one. Okay, so. Um, this painting has a very interesting atmosphere going on and everything. But I, I, is it dry or no? Yes, it's dry. It's dry. Okay, so this is great. Okay, so now what we can do, we look at the initial painting and we say, okay, this is the idea that the artist had, and how can we improve it? Well, first of all, when we get too close to the middle, you know, uh, we start to get a little bit stagnant. So we don't want that feeling, right? So not, none of these paintings that you do outside are a waste of time. The, 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 the thing that you have to learn from this experience today, what we're talking about, is to go back again. See, this is, if you're willing to learn, you'll do these things. You have to go back again and do it again and a better version of it. Why do you think these artists did the same subject over and over and over and over, and over, and over, and over, and over Right? You see series of paints. Why? Because they're working through the idea. A lot of people don't understand. They want, in somehow in their head, a one-off. One-off, and I'm going to hit it or not. No, that's not the way it works. You have to work through it. It's called work. So you're going to go, you're going to go back. And you're going to uh, go back and maybe make a version that's different, you know, like more narrow, uh, less sky, you know, and see what you can get away with. But go back and reintroduce your idea in a different format. Like, that's already more interesting to me, right? So you can do that. You can crop the bottoms, you know and the top, but you uh, have to see, so now that's better, right? So in a workshop, a lot of times we do this stuff. We cut them up. I had a teacher, uh, Italian teacher, Sal Martino. He was one of the greatest illustrators, and he, uh, when I was going to the illustration school, and he, um, it said make sure your paintings are dry before you bring it because you take trace and paper, put it over the top of it and rework it. Go back, do it again. Like 
he would just whip out the pencil and he'd, and he'd fix it and tell you where to go and then we'd redo it. But that's the kind of idea with this one. Mm -hmm. And, and I think we all thank all these artists for doing this because it helps all of us, right? Okay, so this painting, um, this is a good, this is a, a good composition in a lot of ways. Um, I really like the way that this was treated down here. I believe this. Mm -hmm. I believe all of this. I'm, I'm bought it. I bought into that. Like that's all good. I need. I, I this pain is speaking to me. I need. I have too much depth in this pole, and I don't have enough depth back mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. to bring me back here. Yeah. So I, I'm going to reverse that. I'm going to do something to change this. Mm -hmm. And usually in a vertical situation on a pole or uh, a big wall or something, you always have your darkest value. And then as you go down, it gets lighter. That's a little trick. I mean, not a trick. It's something that occurs. That's how you express it in paint. You can take this a little bit lighter down here and let it be darker up there. Vary the sky a little bit. Don't just say, um, this is just straight across. Uh, okay, it could be like one flat piece. Just create a little interest, a variation in clap. You know what? When you're playing or painting outside, uh, it, I know we all get caught up in it. I did it a million times over the years. You're looking at this thing a slave to the thing. And you're like, painting, painting, painting. You're not thinking, like you're not creating. And I'm not saying that person, I, I'm saying I did this myself. You're looking and, and you're not realizing I can't solve this within the frame that I'm looking at. So what do I need to do? Like stand here and look, uh, Joseph, 15 degrees this way and there's a cloud Take that cloud, put it in your paint. <laughs> like, you know, it occurred to me that you could do that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so this needs more depth in here, mm -hmm. and this pole needs to be moderated uh, somehow, and a little variation of the cloud. And I think that, that's good. I mean, this is really believable values down here. I believe all this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of cool. And work on a series of them. Like if you see that idea, that idea needs to go further. You know. Mm -hmm. Okay, I love this example because this is an example that happens reoccurring so many times with artists when they get outside because they get overwhelmed and they don't uh, know after a, a short amount of time, what, what their focus was, and they don't know what they're trying to say. I'm not saying it's all bad. I'm just saying, in here, <clears throat> you have several paintings, right? So you can decide where you want to be with this painting. So um, you, you can, you, you can, it can be about that, you know? Can everybody, it can be mm -hmm. about that. Look at how beautiful. Yeah. Come on, right? So uh, it can be about this. It can be about this. Right. Right. It, it, here's a couple ideas of her that this person can go back to the scene and work again. Work again, right? So, I don't know, not so much that side. But there's at least two good paintings, what I see in there. I mean, that's what I would do. Think about that more than... I mean, this is a common thing to get caught up in, in a lot of it and figure out what you need to do. Wouldn't it be easier to go to a table saw? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's not even a, that's not even a, a, a joke because I... I've I had, I had, I done it. Yeah. I've had plenty of events where I'm like... Yeah. Damn it, this thing is no good, so I 
I went back and I, I tried to cut the thing down to put it in another frame, and it was much better for it. So no, you can do that. I mean, in illustration, as an illustrator, that's the first thing you learn. There is no uh, kindness to your work. You know, right? like you, 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 you lose that very quickly. I remember Charles White, the famous illustrator, did all the Pepsi commercials. He had us line up all our paintings like soldiers, and then we worked on them, killing ourselves for days and days and not sleeping, and then he would go down and, and just slaughter each one of us. And, you know, people were crying and losing it. And, you know, well, they're, they're not going to make it, because the art director right away is like, do it again, do it again. You know. Okay, so this... Um, I, yeah, this reminds me of uh, Maurice uh, Pendergast. I love the feel of the painting, and I love the, the visual stimulation of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I like uh, where I like where this this really got identified, like as being uh, delineated that way, like the separation there. Uh, between this tree and that background, that's a good job on that. Um, I think it gets, there's a couple little issues that go on in this painting, and this happens again, and it's, it's something that we, I work on constantly to prevent myself, but it's a natural thing we all do. It's nothing about this person. But we have a tendency as artists to get into a repeat mode, and we want to repeat, repeat, repeat. So all these uh, shapes are the same size and they're repetitive so uh, you have to figure a way to vary them in size and a little bit in value and then on this side I don't know I would do that first um, and certainly with these paintings with the watercolor uh, I paint in watercolor as well and I uh, like if I had a, a situation like this I would probably go back with a little gouache opaquely and knock some of this down value wise and make it a little bit lighter back here just vary that a little bit some of this is really beautiful though yeah. like this the, the person is developing a good sense for nature and their skills are growing but uh, it's a continuous thing learning to paint trees is is not an easy task mm -hmm. it's like painting the figure so you little by little you get better in each painting uh, but these straight lines, again, I'm not so sure. You might see things in nature, but uh, when you start seeing things that look too much the same, there's where you have to make a decision about how much of that you're going to put in mm -hmm. and how can you simplify the shape, right? Because it's all about that type of thing. But uh, I love the composition, the idea of this composition. The, the format and all that. So that's a good start for this one. I would, again, all these paintings require to go back again. That's what you guys are about. You're all trying to better each other. So you're going to go back again, revisit these things, and do more of them. That's all it's about, more of them. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Five minute break, just go to the bathroom, grab a cookie, and come right back. Actually, I'm going to just set up some. Right now, yeah, we're going to have to go back. We have to do that.